We welcome you to Woodland Baptist Church where we believe the most important thing is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We do thank you so much for your faithfulness to be with us Sunday after Sunday in this platform to be a part of our worship services and our time together to praise and uh, focus upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so whether if you're local and you're a part of our church family, we thank you. If you're long distance, uh, we thank you for joining us that way. So again, your partnership and support and prayers means a lot to us. As we gather together today, we're moving in kind of a different direction now when it comes to our messages and our thoughts when it comes to the scripture. We're going to focus on for the next several weeks the churches that are given to us in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. Each of these churches, Jesus wrote a letter through the Apostle John addressing who, who they are, who they were and where they are and what they were doing in their congregation. And we want to see in a personal way, would Jesus maybe say some, some things to us that he said 2,000 years ago to these churches? And so as we begin, we want to remind ourselves that the book of Revelation is one that we need to be a part of and read. It comes with a blessing. We know of Jesus' blessings he gives to us in Matthew 5. We call them the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted, and so on. But also in the book of Revelation, we have words of blessing. And I would like for us to focus on what we see in chapter 1. Then have a word of prayer as we then proceed in time of praise and, and song to our Lord. And then looking at his word together. But in Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, we read, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. We're blessed, we're fortunate, uh, we're in good standing if we read and give heed and treasure and keep the words that are shared in this powerful and wonderful book. So may God indeed bless us as we share and study it together. May He enrich our lives and give us good direction for who we are and where He is allowed us to serve him in the church in which he has placed us. So let's join together in prayer, asking God to speak to us through song uh, and through his treasure scripture today. Will you bow with me and let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true. We thank you that it's good. We thank you that your word comes with promises and your word comes with blessings. And so, Father, as we begin this journey together in this worship time, we pray that it will be a blessed time. It will be a time that you work in each of our lives. We thank you for your spirit that will help us to understand, that can bring conviction, that will testify to you and remind us of what you have shared and spoken to us. So, Father, we come with great expectation of how you will, again, share your heart. Help us, Father, to receive the, the songs as we sing together and worship you. Father, as we join together to give and to worship you in that way, we thank you for the faithfulness of your people to support your work here. And, Father, as we come again to, your, to the Word of God, we thank you that it's a lamp. We thank you that it's a two-edged sword. May what is needed in our hearts today to accomplish what you would desire, we ask in Jesus' name that the word would be exactly what we need for it to be. And we thank you for, again, its truthfulness, its power, and its goodness for our life. So, thank you for what you have in store. Thank you for what you're going to share with us and Father, we do remember so many needs that are around us in our community, in our state with those hurricane victims that are still struggling. And we thank that great progress of what has been done will continue in the week ahead. So Father, we come with heaviness and awareness, Father, that many people need 
uh, your help and your touch today. And so, Father, with all of that coming together, it's needed that we spend time with you, with one another, in worship. Accomplish much once again, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
seek a lot of different things every day. God, we want the better health. God, we want more money, bigger house, better car. More peace in our relationships. God, more peace in our country. God, we have this, this huge shopping list of things that we wake up every day and look for and that we seek actively. God, that with our minds and with our, with our talents, God, we chase these things. But what we need God is more of you. You are the answer to every problem that we can run into. God, for every shortfall in our lives, God, you are there to give us the increase and to fill it up. And if we would just get out of your way, God, and stop putting all our junk in places where you should be, Father, I just can't imagine. But Father, sometimes you push us out of the way and you put yourself there, God, and I just praise you for that. God, today is my earnest prayer. When I wake up tomorrow morning, God, the first thing that I think is that I need more of you today. And God, that the, the things that I do, the things that I say, Father, reflect that I'm seeking you. Father, thank you for being so faithful. God, that every time that we seek you, you're there. There's never an empty well. Father, we thank you for that. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. What another wonderful moment to share together in song. And thank you for doing where you are, doing that and celebrating our Lord and taking a few moments to focus upon him. Again, we're in Revelation chapter 2, as I shared earlier in our opening thoughts and, and our welcome. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Revelation uh, chapter 2. And again, we're seeking to listen to the Spirit as a church. And we're going to gather the messages that Jesus gave to John to write, and then John writing them down are given to each of these churches. There's seven in all. And so the, we'll be taking one church at a time each Sunday, and so we begin today with Ephesus and the thoughts being uh, behind this church and what Jesus shares with them that the greatest of these is love. And before we read the scripture today, let me just share a, a pattern that we're going to see as we look at these letters that Jesus shared and John wrote. That they follow a, a pattern that we'll see pretty consistent. Uh, they each begin with the name of Jesus. Uh, each of these names are different for each church. If you th think through the letter and look back upon the name that Jesus gives, you can see some correlation in how that name is going to be truly helpful to who they are and what Jesus is calling them to and how he's wanting to work in them. Then most letters have this mixture of compliments or commendations or complaints, or condemnation, where Jesus gives them negatives and positives about their life. Except for the church at Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia, there are no complaints to those two churches. There's only uh, good things, compliments that Jesus gives to them. But in the others, we'll see both of those woven together. And then finally, each letter ends with some phrases. And this idea of he who has an ear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It's very similar to what Jesus shared whenever he was here on earth in his earthly ministry, that he who has an ear, let him hear. But now it's spoken to a group of people, a congregation, a local church. And so that's where we spin off of when we think about this message series that we at Woodland want to listen to the Spirit. At each time we gather on Sunday, we're listening to what the Spirit is wanting us to understand and to receive and to adjust as far as how Jesus is critiquing and evaluating and let us know 
who we are and where we are from his perspective as his people. And then to him who overcomes and then there will be a, a, some explanation or a further thoughts about, about that overcoming. But each church has this thought to him who overcomes. That each church is being challenged to be victorious. To rise above it. There are those negatives, those complaints that they would work through them as described and prescribed uh, by their Lord, by the head of the church to get to where they need to be. They're dealing with uh, suffering and persecution that they would overcome those moments that are hard. And so that's the pattern that we see in these letters. And so just to share as we now read uh, the, the letter that was given to the church at Ephesus, hopefully you'll begin to see these thoughts, this flow that takes place in this letter as we have first seen this overview, this uh, pattern that is given to us. But again, your Bible's Revelation chapter 2. We'll start with verse 1. And the full paragraph of this letter goes to verse 7 to the church at Ephesus. To the angel, which probably most likely is the pastor of the church, to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience. You've labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of of the paradise of God. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we open up our Bibles. We open up our lives for this moment. We thank you that the eternal word of God has a chance once again to be used by the Spirit of God to help us as the people of God to know the will of God. And we thank you that at the very front end of our thoughts today that you are with us and you are working. And we thank you that you are. So Father, we again just humbly come wanting to hear and to receive what your Spirit says to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we look at the text this morning, I would like again to say a word that would be kind of an overview of the entire pilgrimage that we'll be joining in when it comes to the study of these seven churches. Here I would like for us to focus on the, the approach that we want to make sure to take as we say, God, this is what you said to Ephesus. This is what you said to Pergamum. This is what you said to Laodicea. Would there be anything here that you're saying to us? Though you spoke it 2,000 years ago, we receive it as still true, and it can be helpful for our lives. So we want to listen. We want to hear what you're saying, but how we listen and how we receive is so important. To help illustrate these two different thoughts or approaches, making sure that we choose the best one, let us think about the idea of mowing, lawnmower mowing, but then the idea of a shovel and its purpose of digging. We live now in the season during the summer 
Even though it's September here, we're still needing to mow. Things are very green, and when it's not too wet, we can get the mower out there and accomplish uh, what needs to be done. And of course, there's nothing like a freshly mowed lawn. It looks so smooth and looks so good after being so frazzled and how it's grown and everything. So to mow it, it just appears to be so much nicer. But we understand that even after we mow the grass and it all looks nice and it's all smooth, that still that we can maybe take a walk across that lawn, freshly mowed, looking good, but still there might be some stickers. So we're careful maybe still not to walk barefooted. That though it's all mowed, that maybe woven into the good grass, there's still weeds that exist there. And so we've mowed it and it looks nice, but still there are things in it that maybe are not nice. This is the approach that we want to make sure to avoid as we look at each of these seven churches. That we don't want to just mow our spiritual life. That we just don't want it to look nice and smooth and even. That it can look attractive but still hidden or bad spots. Things that are not needed to remain there. And it's those bad spots that maybe what Jesus is wanting to address. And so if we just mow, we might can see that we can avoid it. It doesn't look near as bad when it was all scruffy and grown up, but they're still there. And so when it comes to our personal lives, when it comes to our life as a church, let's make sure that we're not mowing when we let the Spirit of God speak to us through these messages and these letters to each of these churches. Let us, on the other hand, choose the shovel. Let's choose this idea of digging, that even before or after we mow, that we can see the bad stickers, the thorny things that are in our grass, that we can detect the weeds, And instead of just mowing to make it look good, we can dig. We can go down into the soil to where the roots are and dig up that weed, dig up that sticker, thorny area and get it out. So it can not only look good, but it can be good. This is the approach that we want to take to our spiritual life. This is the approach that we want to take as a church. Lord, this is how we want to evaluate or receive your evaluation of who we are and where we are, that once you expose that we don't want to mow, but Father, we'll take the shovel and we'll penetrate that area in our life that does not need to remain anymore. So we'll give the extra effort to get rid of the roots and get to the root problem, the root issue, and dig it out so it will not be there anymore. Let us choose together with the Spirit's help, with the church at Ephesus and on through our journey together through these seven churches, that we would want to be diggers, that the tool that we will choose will be that shovel, and that we will allow the Spirit of God to speak in a way, shovel in hand, that as He makes us aware of maybe things that have existed in our hearts, existed in His church for years, that this will be the moment. These weeks, these days, it will be the moment that we're not going to mow it anymore and let it hang around. But no, we're going to eliminate it. We're going to have God to help us to fully remove it so that our lawn our spiritual lawn of who we are as God's people can truly not just again look nice when mowed, but be exactly what He wants it to be with all the other things that are not of Him removed. Now, our text this morning from the book of Ephesus, the book, Revelation 2, about the letter to Ephesus. First we see the compliments by Christ, the things that he shared about them that was very favorable. <laughs> very, And they have a great list <laughs> of things that Jesus uh, commends them for and who they have become about knowing their works and their labor. That word know is the Greek word that communicates the idea that Jesus fully knows. 
For sure, this is what he knows, and this is the accurate understanding that that's been given. There's other words for know in the New Testament language about progressively knowing. We're on our way to knowing. That's not the word here. The word here is that Jesus is saying, I know, I know fully, I know completely, I know with sureness this is who you are and what you've been about. And so the works and the labor and the attitude of patience and not bearing of evil. Wow, what again, a strong list of things to be complimented for. Yeah, this church has endured. In the New King James, as I read, it used the word persevered and the idea of patience. This idea that they have been long suffering, suffering through things that they've been having to deal with, but also this standing this persevering of strength that they've had to walk through, of things coming against them. They've been able to move together well and persevere and hang in there with one another. One, I mean, one thing that's been the issue they've had to hang in there for is this idea of false teaching, that the church has not tolerated false teaching. They've not tolerated heresy that has been promoted among themselves and around them. We see in verse 2 and verse 6, two different fronts that have come against them. We see these that have been pseudo-apostles, false apostles. They said they were, but they were not. Most likely this is a group called the Judaizers. The Judaizers. This group was Jewish Christians, those who had said they would have received Christ but still the Jewish part of their thinking and their religion was still very, very strong. And so, yes, you could receive Christ, but you still had to give full attention to the Mosaic law. You still had to be a Jew. And so that's the teaching that they bring in, that Jesus is not enough. You need Jesus plus. You need Jesus and the law. And so that was the Judaizers' teaching. And again, that would not be consistent with what we know the truth of Scripture and the revelation of Christ and the salvation that we have through Him. It's not Jesus and something else. It's not Jesus and plus. No, it's just Jesus alone. The grace that God provided Him is sufficient for our salvation. But on verse 6, we see another, what we might would say would be a cult. The Nicolaitans. Different thoughts about where they came from, but one that's very interesting was that if we go to the book of Acts in chapter 6, whenever the seven leaders were chosen that we would refer to maybe as the first deacons, the word's not used there, but their role is very descriptive of what we see a deacon's role is. And so Nicholas was one of those seven that was chosen by the church, full of the spirit and wisdom, which was the criteria that was used for the selection of these men. And Nicholas was one of them. The thought is that as time moved along, Nicholas did not stay true. Nicholas did not stay with Christ. That he seemed to entertain false teaching. And that the Nicolaitans were named for him. That he was their ring leader, as it were. Their cult follower that uh, head, headed up this teaching of sensuality and immorality and the embracing of false gods and, and pagan worship. And so, again, Ephesus, just as they held up strong to the Judaizers, say, no, our teaching does not mean that we receive Jesus and have to do the Mosaic law. No, that's not where we're headed. That's not what we're doing here. At the same time, the Church at Ephesus would hang in, no, that's not the truth of Christ. That's not who he was. That does not match his character, that kind of worship, uh, that type of pagan worship. That's not who we are. And so we see that they did not tolerate, they did not put up with false teaching. They were able to discern what was true and what was not. And their testing proved them to stay true to Christ. And then finally, we see the church worked hard. Uh, they labored. We see that word a couple of times in this letter that's given by Jesus to John to write. And that 
word communicates toiling. <laughs> uh, they even sweated. They gave a lot of energy, a lot of time to make sure that Christ would be upheld and how they labored, what they did and their activities, the works, all these things that they were strong in how they presented themselves with God and being honorable in their work and in their labor. I could not help but think of Barnabas and uh, these descriptions and who he was and how he persevered with Saul who became Paul and though they had a run in then he persevered with his uh, nephew John Mark and helped him to get back on track and whenever they have a uh, the message that the word of Christ is spread in, in Antioch Barnabas is the one that is sent there we see someone I believe that was not that first generation disciple but came as a follower of Christ in the next generation, someone who really demonstrated these complimentary words that Christ gave that is being extended to Ephesus. We see Barnabas as a personal example, I believe, of how he held in there with truth. He did not uh, faint easily. He did not get weary. He was available. He, he worked in those circumstances changed. He was the one who hung in there for the underdog. Wow. I would think like Barnabas is a great example of who we need to be as an individual, as a church. That Ephesus is a good example about how striving and working together, hanging in there for truth, is what Jesus would want us to do. But then we see the complaints. We see the negative. And it's only one. The list of positives uh, is much longer than the list of, of the complaint. But Jesus shares that, and he, but he does with help, that it's a negative word, but I'm going to give you some guidance to work out of that. He says, I have this against you. That word against is the idea that Jesus is in opposition. He's against his church in this particular aspect, that they had left their first love. The church had stopped loving God first. He mentions that that's not how it always had been. He talked about the need that they need uh, to be challenged to remember, to bring that back in front of them. That there were more pleasant days than what they have experienced. That maybe uh, the, the work of having to stand strong in truth, the work of being laborious and enduring, has maybe taken its toll of how they are, their attitude, and that maybe they've done these good things, but they have lost perspective of God. And of course, this is the first commandment. This is the greatest commandment, and this is where they have shifted. And so they need to go back and evaluate, gather together. Let's exercise some memory here. That's what the word remember is. That let's rehearse how it was back maybe some years ago when we first started, how in love that we were with Christ. We've gotten so maybe heavy trodden in these issues that we have still left. And though they've been good, still we're being scrutinized by our Lord that we need to adjust and get back to where we were in our relationship to Him. And so here's the help that, J that Jesus gives that John writes down is that the church's only solution to get back on track, to get back to their first love and prioritize that is to repent. They need to make a turn. They need to shift of how they are now thinking and their attitude toward their life, toward each other, as well as to the community that's around with them. All the things they've and had to deal with, Nicolaitans over here, Judaizers over here, all this service and all this work, that maybe still there's a need to confess that we've been wrong. That we have shifted our heart, though we have been about good things. And so that's a strong word. And that's, again, maybe where the shovel is the only way that we can get that out, is this, the shovel of repentance. Mowing here will not be sufficient, but it needs to be completely taken out and eliminated. Because we see a kind of almost a cruel word from Christ if that's not going to be done. 
if that solution of repentance is not going to be chosen as a group of people, he says, quickly, I'm going to remove your lampstand, or your Bible may say candlestick, that here is the place where the idea that you are a light, you are shining in Ephesus, you are my awareness of that I exist and that I'm alive. It's through you and your lives together that shines brightly to those around you. But if there is no remembering that brings about a returning or repenting, there's going to be some removing. Wow, what a thought. <laughs> that no longer will you exist effectively. Yeah, you may still get together and worship on Sundays. You can still sing and do all these things, but please know that unless there's repentance, you can gather, but again, there, you, you, you'll be dark. No light will shine. Don't get confused there that we can be a gathered people but still not be Jesus' light that shines brightly. And maybe you think, but wait a minute. <laughs> he just gave them this list of great compliments, <laughs> a great list of standing up for truth and not false teaching putting it down, discerning what was wrong and dealing with it, that they had been working hard and enduring and being long-suffering, and yet we might not longer exist effectively for our Lord only because of this one complaint. Let us remind ourselves of Matthew 7 where the testimony that Jesus gives will be of those who said, Lord, we've done great things. We've healed Demons have been cast out. And yet at the end of that moment, Jesus says, depart from me because I never knew you. Is that maybe an inkling trying to begin to understand again? Great work. Stood up for truth. Even used my name, but you didn't know me. That there was no again love relationship that was grounding and founding that person and what they did. Again, that we can live out something that may not be exactly true in our relationship to God. I shared earlier this week about Luke 10, where the disciples who had been sent out two by two, and there they were coming back, pretty pumped, really excited that how they had been used and what they had accomplished. Because they share about again, Great things happening, healing and miracles taking place, demons being cast out of people. And there Jesus receives, yes, I've been in prayer for you and I've seen the evil one fall and all these things because of what furtherance and the moving forward of the kingdom that, kingdom that took place in people's lives and in people's hearts. But then Jesus, before he concludes his thought, he says, but don't rejoice that all those things went well. Don't get too excited and focus upon what I would say would be successful service. But really rejoice, really connect, and don't lose sight of that you have a relationship with me, that your name is written in the book of life. That is what really matters. That is where you need to celebrate. So another verse that again accentuates and underscores, yes, activity in Jesus' name can be a powerful moment. But really, don't rejoice in success, but rejoice that you know me and that I love you and you love me, that you know my name, that I know your name. That is where true success can take place. Yes, we can be truthful and lack love. In these days that we live, it is so easy for us to get sarcastic in how we respond to what's going on around us in our world today. And though we may be absolutely correct, and we can give scriptural support for our position, if our heart of love is missing, it might be better that we just remain quiet. Because there is no way to communicate God's truth 
without his love. The Pharisees remind us of an example that they can have truth. They had good doctrine. They served hard. They worked hard. They endured a lot in all they were going through. And yet, their hypocritical approach allowed them to miss God and their relationship to Him. That we can be truthful but still carry out the attitude of the devil in how we approach it. And Jesus would remind us today as he reminds Ephesus that don't depart from me. Do not leave the love relationship with me. Yes, you will have to go through some tough things, some hard things. You will need to make sure that truth is held up. But as you work through that, never forsake love. And that tilts us back to the thought of of our message today as we think about Paul's words as he brings to an end in 1 Corinthians 13 the greatest of these is love the superlative of love and it was grouped with some other wonderful things hope and faith that's pretty important too when it comes to our Christian life and our Christian pilgrimage but Paul would say though they're good but the greatest of those three is love. He began that same chapter by referring to various gifts that he had been speaking about. But he says this excellent way, this way of love, that you can have the gift of tongues and be able to share all this, but if you don't have love, you're just like a clanging cymbal. You're just a bunch of noise. He would go on to say that without love, you can have prophecy and you can have a word from God, you can trust and have faith in God, but if love is not moving that, if your care and agape of loyalty to God is not primarily shaping how you're sharing that, then it's nothing. It's zero. That word from God will add up to nothing unless love is prompting your heart in sharing and in believing. That you can give all that you have to the poor. And how much that is needed. That we can make this mission trip and share in a few weeks to a group. But if we don't have love, it's going to profit zero. No matter how we extend ourselves, that service can be a snare. That we can serve and still have resentment. That we can serve in Jesus' name, but all that it exposes is how much I want to be in control as we serve, that how much this ministry of service is really my ministry. That may be service, though needed, though in a wonderful testimony of Jesus working in our life and our growth in Him, but still, there is no replacement for love. Love of God. It is indeed the greatest commandment. It is the greatest of these is love. This is our important word from Ephesus. That are we there as a church? Are we walking with God in this way of love? Would Jesus correct us in any way? Yeah, you're working hard. You're discerning untruth. You're enduring and long-suffering and persevering. Thank you. But we've really got to address the lack of love. You don't love me anymore. Would Jesus say that about Woodland? Is all that we're doing really a bunch of noise? I'm just asking that we hear from the Spirit today. He can say it a whole lot better than I can. But I would ask us once again, as he speaks to us, you have the shovel in hand. That you're going to dig down to the root problem of where your lack of love of him started. And you're going to make sure that as you would want to serve, and as you would want to hold up truth in a strong way for his name, that you have first solidly in your heart that you love him with all that you are. Is that true of you? Do you love him with your total being? Woodland Baptist Church, do we love our Lord first? If not, 
Let's begin to make steps to come and return to our first love. He's missed us. He's calling out to us. Let's run to him. Let him know that we've been wrong and that we're sorry. That he would empower us to repent. And that we can get back to still truth, still working hard and serving. But again, the bedrock foundation of love is back in place. Will you pray with me? Father, you've called us to an important word this morning, an important thought that may be hard to differentiate because we prize and we elevate and we magnify so much external outward service and things that can be seen. So Father, help us to look past all that and to allow your microscope, as it were, to see our heart. And have we left you? We're still coming to church, but have we left you as our first love? We still pray and read our Bible, but have we left you as our first love? We've signed up to be on the mission team or to serve in this particular ministry, but do we love you? We love kids, maybe. We love our community, but Father, do we love you? That's the first love. First in degree, first in chief and foremost in priority. Father, if there's any way that we have shifted our heart and love of you is not where it needs to be, Father, we just want to say that we want to start today allowing you to make changes there. That we would come softly and humbly to you and you can do a work. That you can put us on that operating table as it were and perform a wonderful surgery to help our lives to get back to remembering how it used to be repenting Father remind us there's a lot at stake removal that hurts Father help us to choose to return and to repent in the powerful work of digging up the root system of a lack of love can be accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. Yo
Lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Fall in his arms, come as you are. no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. Lay down your heart, lay down your heart, 